So the big news of the week has been the kerfuffle between Ubisoft and Larian. So we're going to take a few minutes now to talk about this. I will be cribbing off of Game Discover Co.'s breakdown of this. The link for that will be in the description. I encourage you to go read that because it's an excellent source. And in particular, if you are developing a game currently, you should absolutely be following them. But most of you probably know what this is about. Uh, it's kind of been all anyone's been talking about for the last few days. But here's the rundown again from Game Discover Co. Ubisoft subscriptions exec talked about how the consumer shift of people not owning games anymore needs to happen, which irked some hardcore gamers. And replying to an IGN tweet about what needs to happen before subscription services become a more significant slice of the video game business, Sven Vink said, Whatever the future of games look like, content will always be king. But it's going to be a lot harder to get good content if subscription becomes the dominant model and a select group gets to decide what goes to market and what not. Direct from developer to players is the way. We are already all dependent on a select group of digital distribution platforms and discoverability is brutal. Should these platforms all switch to subscription, it'll become savage. Now, honestly, he's playing this up as a very moral angle, but from what I've heard, it's... As always, in situations like this, we pretend it's moral or ethical, and really it's pragmatic. Uh, we have a pretty good idea of what how much money BG3 has made. Uh, I've heard how much money they've been offered for subscription services, and if they took that deal, they would almost certainly lose a massive amount of money. So uh, holding out is just a good business decision for them. But in terms of what he says more broadly about the video game market, I'm inclined to think he's wrong about most of this. So let's break this down again. Uh, whatever the future of games look like, content will always be king. Uh, it'll be a lot harder to get good content if subscription becomes the dominant model. So here's uh, Game Discover Co.'s take on that. Uh, for Swin, subscription services, besides gatekeeping, are also too calculating. Getting a board to okay a project fueled by idealism is almost impossible, and idealism needs room to exist, even if it can lead to disaster. Subscription models will always end up being cost-benefit analysis exercises intended to maximize profit. Oddly, contrasting with Sony's more conservative approach with PS Plus, we think that subservices like Game Pass sometimes get used as a sinkhole for costs on interesting and creative first-party games that might otherwise not get made. I am inclined to agree with this. That's actually a really weird statement, this idea that subscription services somehow inhibit creativity. So I'm going to make a comparison that's very imprecise, which is I'm going to compare this to premium, basically premium audio and video. So we're talking about Spotify, we're talking about Netflix here, which is not an exact comparison, because in that case, we are comparing a free product to a premium product, whereas in this case, we're looking at two different premium products with just different models attached to them. Honestly, a better comparison for video games would be third party versus first party, which we could also discuss here. But the issue is this. As I say many times when talking about like, a premium television, uh, when you are paying for it, uh, the shows, the movies, whatever's on the platform, those are not the product. The platform is the product. The shows, the songs, whatever, are the marketing. They're the advertisements to get you to purchase the product. That's an important thing to consider. Ultimately, for, for Netflix, for Hulu, for Spotify, for any of these services, it doesn't really matter what you watch, and they're not dependent on an individual show being a huge hit. When you're looking at advertised-supported TV, broadcast television, there's a reason why, to this day, you still see shows made that are in the same genre categories that have existed since the dawn of television. Because these are very, very popular, and for advertising-supported television or music, or anything else, you need to reach the widest audience possible. But if you're on a premium service, you're partially insulated from that. That's why, for example, HBO has always been known for more interesting programming than what you would get on advertisement-supported television. Now, again, this is a different situation because they're both premium products, but I think there's something very similar going on. Third-party developers, like I said, this is a more 
direct comparison. Third-party games uh, tend to be about the same thing over and over. You're looking at the same genres. There's a reason why you still get the same kind of realistic war shooters year after year, the same sports games, because these are guaranteed to be big hits. They're going to return reliable returns, and that's what the investors like. Now, what you get with the first-party developers, if you look at games that are specific to Nintendo or Sony, they tend to be a little more interesting. They tend to be a little bit more adventurous people. A lot of people have pointed this out, and that's because those games don't need to sell an enormous number of copies. They often do, but really what those games are are advertisements for the hardware. So in cases like that, you can get more interesting, quirkier games because they are partially insulated from market pressures. And there is every reason to assume that subscription services could do something similar. They might not. I mean, obviously, I'm talking about Netflix and we know what their programming looks like these days and it's not exactly bold and creative, but it's at least a possibility. It's weird to me to think that that would suppress creativity more than letting, say, Ubisoft or Capcom or Konami or any other large company, um, ABK, decide this directly. That's where you're getting the problems because they're going to expect you to show that you can appeal to tens of millions of people. Whereas in a subscription service, that doesn't necessarily need to be the case. Um, I was briefly on Game Pass. I didn't really care for it because it's a lot of AAA stuff and I don't care. But while I was on there, I found a game that I'd heard of, never bought, uh, called Where the Water Tastes Like Wine, a game that is very hard for me to describe in a short period of time, so I'm not even going to bother. But it is the kind of game that it did not do super well on the open market, but I suspect it probably did fairly well on Game Pass, just because it's kind of the quirky thing people notice. You might not subscribe for it, but if you know there's more games like it, that's um, inducement to sign up. Uh, incidentally, I interviewed the, uh, composer of that game, not to drop names, but I will do it again in this video, I'm sure. So, continuing through this, uh, in an indirect repast to Vink, Circana's Matt Piscatella points out, subscription growth is flattened, and subservices on console and PC platforms account for only 10% of total video game content spending in the U.S., I get that some people want to protect their preferred model, but the idea that subs will become dominant is unsupported by data. Not to drop names of people with channels that are far, far, far bigger than mine, but I've actually had this argument a few times with Shane Lewis, who sincerely believes that uh, one day that everything's going to be subscription-based, which could well happen uh, for various reasons we could get into right now. I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Um... He seems to believe that one day, like, Mario and Zelda games will be on every platform, and I don't agree with that. But the point is, these are still pretty niche services. This is really, there's a tendency in, really in the tech press in general, not just in video games, that anytime there's something new, we pretend like it's just going to be the only thing. Like, it's going to replace everything in five years. You might recall when cloud gaming was, like, the thing that was going to replace everything. No one was going to own hardware anymore. Uh... VR kind of fit into that uh, framework, and ultimately these are things that have an impact on the market, but it's never this annihilating force. Like, there's no question that subscription services have had an effect. Uh, as I said the last time I did this, I full well believe they are exerting downward pressure on prices, but at the same time, they just aren't a big enough part of the overall spending, as pointed out uh, in uh, by Game Discover Co., to really amount to this all-destroying force. Like, this probably isn't going to happen. I, I think a lot of the outrage over this, a lot of times it's something small that a lot of people notice, and then content creators grab a hold of it and exaggerate it for drama, is this idea of not owning the games that you buy. Well, I got news. If you're Buying games digital, you already don't own the games that you buy. And actually, 
this idea of, oh, I'm never going to let the big companies take that away from me. That's the same thing I heard 20 years ago when we started to go over to digital distribution. And, you know, I people say, oh, Steam, I'm never going to do the Steam thing. I'm only going to buy my games physical and look where we are today. It's one of those things people, it's, it's, a, it's a tempest in a, a teapot and then people move on. And that's just kind of the way it is. So let's keep going on here. The market is changing. Uh, back to Game Discover Co. here. And both there's too many games and the rise of subscription services are part of that. For us, the former is the bigger factor and the latter is the smaller one. Absolutely. Like the reason there are too many games, too much competition, has nothing to do with subscription services. Point of fact, Game Discover Co. also had a thing about how many games currently exist. Because we talk about, oh, there's, you know, 12,000, 14,000, however many games are released this year. But the nature of the video game market now with the fact that, you know, you don't wipe out your library every time you buy a new console. Our libraries are kind of evergreen now. Talking about how many games come out each year is missing the point. The question is, how many games are there? And on Steam, it's just under 80,000. Now, on the consoles, it's obviously a lot less, but it's still an enormous number. It ranges from about 5,000 on Xbox to 11,000 on Switch. And that is, for your typical, especially for your indie developer, a far, 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 far bigger problem than whatever effects are being caused by subscription services. No question. So continuing to uh, Game Discover Co.'s analysis. Overall, the direct-to-market safety valve for games is threefold and vibrant and quite different to films and TV where intermediaries dominate partially due to the high minimum cost of making that media. So here are three. On the high end, you have deep complex games as a service titles that can support their own ecosystems and monetize within them. On the low end, you have self-funded viral hits from small devs that go direct to market. Underpinning everything is a big chunk of gamers wanting to 100% own their game catalog, which as I said, they don't not rent them. The approach still encouraged by Steam and a majority of other platforms. Now, this is pointing out something which, if you look into like the business of video games, is a big deal right now, which is the idea of the market being hollowed out. What we're seeing is that viable games are increasingly being pushed towards the extremes. On the one hand, you have these big triple A tentpole games that increasingly they have budgets going into the nine figure range. They take years to make and they make gigantic amounts of money. And then at the other extreme, you have these nil budget games made by like one or two or three people that come out on Steam every day and every once in a while one of them blows up and because the overhead is so low, they can charge a tiny amount of money and succeed in this very competitive environment. And the notion is that as time goes on, the range for what's viable in between those just keeps shrinking. So a lot of those mid-range kind of double A, but even like larger indie games and smaller triple A games are just not working out as well as they used to. And there's been a lot of kind of consternation over what's going to happen to these because we don't want there to be a world where the only games available are these giant, massively risky, potentially studio-destroying mega hits and, you know, crappy little budget games that look like stuff from Newgrounds 20 years ago. We don't, there needs to be room in between those two things. And one thing Game Discover Co. is kind of suggesting, if only implicitly, is that subscription services could become a home for these. Point, uh, let me quote them. It's the gap between the high end and the low end of the direct market, slightly exacerbated by the ease of accessing so many great mid-tier games via subscription. That is where things get messy. That absolutely affects spending for big complex pay-once games like CRPGs going forward. And although Vink's company swung for the fences and hit a giant home run, that's just not easy in today's market. Which I think is kind of the takeaway from this, is the video game market right now is incredibly difficult. Uh, a lot of people who comment on this don't really seem to reckon with that. They don't really uh, deal with the business side of it in any meaningful way. It is incredibly difficult to succeed. There's not some simple formula that everyone can follow that can result in, you know, 
at every game being successful as much as certain people in the industry whose names I won't mention, Destin Ligari, would have you think otherwise. So you have a situation where for a lot of these mid-tier games, and frankly for a lot of games that are kind of harder to classify, the idea of being able to, again, slightly insulate them from market pressures with these subscription services is very appealing. And uh, I do not believe, at the very least not in the near future, in the foreseeable future, that this is going to become the end-all be-all, that this is going to be everything there is. But I do believe that they're always going to have a role, and that role is actually going to be fairly important. Because there are just a lot of interesting games and stuff like where the water tastes like wine, which flopped when it went out as a premium game. I don't know how well it did as a subscription title. My guess is it did pretty well. And I think there is going to be a room for things like this that is certainly not going to threat, threaten Baldur's Gate 3. I really don't know why he got into this. Um, anyone from that company got involved with this. It just doesn't... Again, except to point out that, yeah, if we would have taken the deal, we would have made a lot less money, which they would have. I, you know, I, I'm not going to say I'm 100% sure about that, but I'm pretty damn sure. I don't know. Starfield was in uh, the Game Pass from day one. It seemed to do okay. 